And so I have a, a book in my study called Beyond the Worship War- Wars, which seems to be saying the worship wars are over. Those of you who've been around the church for a long time, you might know the phrase worship war. Um, back in the day when there became this thing called contemporary music, which now sounds old, right? But it was contemporary in its time, right? Um, we were just kumbaya and all over the place back in the day. And, and it was like, no, we got to sing the hymns. No, we got to sing traditional. And it was this big fights breaking out and drums in the church, oh, electric guitars in the church, oh, you know, and it was just this big hullabaloo. But we forget that there was a group of people on whom it was the hardest, and that was churches with hymnals. Um, it's the last time anybody sang out of a hymnal. When I first moved to Texas, I remember driving down, I believe it was Spring Stubner, and there was a church, and um, it had a sign out front that said, we use two books, the KJV and a hymnal. So, well, there you go, folks. Uh, the canon is closed on both of those, I suppose. But anyway, um, <laughs> here's what happens is if you're in a denomination that has its very own hymnal every 15, 20 years, it's time to update the hymnal. So a committee gets together and they start asking the questions, what are we adding, what are we leaving out? Wouldn't you love to be on that committee? And when I very, very first started going to church and learned what a hymnal was and saw these songs, there were these rumblings among the Baptist about the Methodist, and they were coming out with a new hymnal and the songs they were going to leave out. And there was this huge fight in 19... 80, late 80s, over this one hymn that the Methodists decided to leave out of their hymnal. And it was this hymn, Onward Christian Soldiers. Now, they had already tweaked some other songs, like Good Christian Men Rejoice, or God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen. Well, we can't just sing to the man. So we'll tweak those. Um, They took out bringing in the sheaves because nobody who lives in the city knows what in the world a sheave is. And we always joke, every time the Ingalls went to church on Little House on the Prairie, they always sang bringing in the sheaves. Those people knew what sheaves were. Okay, so there goes bringing in the sheaves. But here we come, onward Christian soldiers. And it sounded so militaristic and it has a marching tune to it, right? And it glorifies battle and violence. Nope, we're leaving it out. So word got out that this hymnal was going to print and Onward Christian Soldiers was not going to be in it. And you can read the stories. Uh, Over 10,000 phone calls to the United Methodist headquarters. Their system was crashed for a couple of weeks because everybody's calling in. 8,000 letters they received about this one hymn. Only 40 of those letters were for taking it out. So the other 7,960 were like, what do you think you're doing? And the people on the committee said we were called soft-hearted anti-American communist. (laughs) So the world hasn't changed that much since the late 80s, right? (laughs) Everybody's a communist. So they left it in, and onward Christian soldiers marching as to war with the cross of Jesus going on before. Anybody grow up singing that one? Yeah, we remember that one a little bit. Um, Like a mighty army moves the church of God. We are not divided, all one body, we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. Sounds beautiful. Sounds great. Sounds like a great prayer uh, to pray. Um, but we don't use this imagery very much, right? We, we don't talk as much about battle and war, and march, so we don't sing marching songs. At least I don't think in the right way. Um, it's a good day to ask, are we fighting the right battles and <laughs> who's fighting with us? Um, and today's name, today's title of God is a military title. It's a title of war. Um, and you may know this one because at some point in your life you may have sang the song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, written by Martin Luther. And it has two words we never sing. The first one, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. What's a bulwark? That's what he is. Yeah, okay. Um, But the second verse, I believe, or third verse, did we in our own strength confide our striving would be losing? We're not the right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing. 
Dost ask who that may be? Christ Jesus, it is he. Lord Sabaoth is his name. From age to age the same. And he must win the battle. Um, so in Martin Luther's day, you could just throw Lord Sabaoth in a hymn and people would just sing it, right? Um, take heart, Joey. You can write songs with Hebrew names in them and people will sing them. So 200 years from now, if we're still around, we'll still be Joey Hensley at the bottom right corner on the screen and we'll be singing this song, right? <laughs> Lord Saba, <coughs> excuse me. Lord Sabaoth, Yahweh Sabaoth. Um, the Lord of hosts is what most of your Bible translations that you might have with you say, Lord of hosts. It's kind of familiar. Um, some will say Lord Almighty. I think that's reserved for a different one. We'll come back to that later. Um, I have with me today the um, Christian Standard Bible, the HCHB, now the CSB, and it has Lord of armies. Uh, if you have the message, it says Lord of angel armies. Uh, if you sing the Chris Tomlin song, you know God of angel armies, always by our side. Um, when the Bible speaks of host, it uses it a couple of different ways, three really. Um, first of all, it uses the starry host, the, 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 the stars without number, and it calls them the host, and he is the Lord of every star. He knows every star by name, and it says he put each one of them exactly where he wanted them right? And so he's the Lord of the starry host, the heavenly host, but then uh, Lord of the angel armies. Um, a couple of passages that describe uh, the armies of heaven they use uh, whenever it's, whenever like you see them all together. It says there were myriads of myriads. Like there were just so many angels. It was like the stars, can't count them. You couldn't even count these angels. It says there were multitudes of multitudes. Now, multitude must be big, but what if it's multitudes of multitudes? It's just, they just go on and on like the stars do. And then sometimes it's, it's, it's a host of battle that's arranged um, here on earth. He's the Lord of hosts. He's Lord of the heavens. He's Lord of the earth. He's Lord of angel armies. He is the Lord of that army. This army that fights on our behalf. So then you immediately start feeling uh, some comfort, right? He's fighting for us. Who's saving us? Who's fighting for us? Are we on the right team? It would be good. And so um, I want to tell um, two stories this morning about the Lord of hosts. And then I want to look at a couple of New Testament themes that will bring it closer to home for us. Um, the first story is a very familiar story. It's the story um, that you know of David and Goliath um, for Samuel 17. You know the story. Um, Philistine army, Israel army, they're just standing there looking at each other day after day because they've come up with a plan. Um, you bring out your best, we'll bring out our best. Let them fight, win or take all. The only problem is the Philistines have a giant. Um, Apparently even the giant had brothers, but there's Goliath, and he's big and mean, and he's a mocker and a scorner and a bully, and he comes out every day and makes fun of the other side because they won't send anybody out to fight them, him. And so day after day after day, out he walks, everybody starts hiding, and then one day David shows up, and he's like, what's going on here? Look, he's, he, he, he's big. Nobody will go out and fight him, right? And he's just out there mocking Israel and their God. And David's like, well, why would we let him do this? I'll fight him. And Saul's like, well, here, take my armor. And the armor doesn't fit. And he's like, no, I, we, no, none of this. I'm not used to this. So David just goes out and what he usually wears, takes his staff five smooth stones from the creek, puts them in his pouch and his shepherd's bag, goes out to battle, he approaches the Philistine, Goliath comes closer, Goliath's got a shield bearer, he looks and sees David and says, what am I, some little dog, you come at me with your stick, and it says he cursed David by his gods. 
Come here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beast. So Goliath not only says, I'm bigger than you, you little kid, but I've got gods. And your God is obviously chicken because I've been doing this for 40 days. And David says to the Philistine, you come against me with sword, spear, and javelin. You got three weapons, big guy. I come against you in the name of the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts. Yahweh Sabaoth, the God of the armies of Israel. And you have defied him, and today he will hand you over to me, and I'm going to strike you down. And he says this to his face. This isn't just an after-the-fight thought, oh, I think I'll do this. He tells this to Goliath before anything happens. I'm going to strike you down and cut off your head. <laughs> and the birds are going to eat you. Whew. Sounds like trash talking. But David is passionate because this man has spoken against his God, and his God is Yahweh Shabbat, and he's the Lord of hosts. So David looks at Goliath and says, no, 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 no. You're on my God's turf, and this is a battle with his people, and he has an army uh, bigger than any army you can even imagine. And so, whew, 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 the rock goes splat in the head. Down goes Goliath. Lord of hosts. And then everybody gets courage in that moment. Off they go. Chase them down, battle over. And David becomes the man. It's the Lord of hosts. He wins the battle. David had done this before. He had killed the lion. He had killed the bear. He had slung a stone or two. But he knew, what does it say? I'm coming to you in his name, Lord of armies, Lord of hosts. And you're defying him. Another story. It's over in Isaiah and also back in the Kings and Chronicles. It's the story of, of Hezekiah and Assyria's coming. And they're on their way, and everybody's terrified because Assyria is the big, biggest, baddest bully on the planet. And nobody's God has saved them yet. And they don't know what to do. And so God comes through the prophet Isaiah, and he warns the people. Do not call everything a conspiracy that these people say is a conspiracy. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be terrified. You are to regard only the Lord of hosts, only the Lord of armies, Yahweh Sabaoth, as holy. Only he should be feared. Only he should be held in awe. So you see the Assyrians and they're powerful, and they're terrible, and they mock you, and they've beat everyone they've come against. And you're terrified. And, and Isaiah says, but there's someone more terrifying than the Assyrians. He's Yahweh Sabaoth. He's the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. Fear him, hold him in awe, and let him take care of this. And Isaiah, Hezekiah is facing this temptation to go south to Egypt and to get their help. In Egypt, they're pagans. They've got lots of gods, but they've also got horses and chariots. And those horses and chariots would be really helpful fighting Assyria. And Assyria is now at the door, and they're there mocking them. And they send this messenger, and he says, I know you think your God will save you, but look at every other country we defeated. Their God didn't save them. Why do you think yours will be any different? Isaiah comes to Hezekiah and says, Woe, Isaiah 31, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who depend on horses, who trust in the abundance of chariots and in the large number of horsemen, and do not look to the Holy One of Israel, and they do not seek the Lord. Egyptians are men, not God. Their horses are flesh, not spirit. When the Lord raises his hand to strike, the helper will stumble. 
This is what the Lord says to me. As a young lion growls over its prey when a band of shepherds is called out against it and is not terrified by their shouting or subdued by their noise. There's the picture. The lion has a lamb and the shepherd comes to get the lamb from the lion and the lion just looks at him and says, I'm not scared of you. He just growls. He says, so Yahweh Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, will come down to fight on Mount Zion, and on its hill, and like hovering birds, so the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, will protect Jerusalem, and by protecting it, he will rescue it, and by sparing it, he will deliver it. And Assyria will fall, but not by human sword, but one not made by man, he will flee. The Lord of hosts, Hezekiah, he's got a multitude you wouldn't believe. You couldn't even begin to count the number of soldiers. I know you look out over the wall and you see an army that has never been defeated. Don't go to Egypt for help. Don't go to Egypt for help. Don't talk about conspiracy this, conspiracy that. No. Look to the Lord of hosts. And that's exactly who Hezekiah goes and prays to. There's the scene where he goes into the temple. And he says, Lord of hosts, I'm going to allow you to fight for me, not going to Egypt. And God takes care of Assyria. All right? And we could go on and on with the stories. Um, the great story in, in 2 Kings when Aram comes down to fight um, it's a great story because um, everywhere the king of Aaron is going to go to wage war, he goes here and sets up camp, and God tells the prophet Elisha, and Elisha goes and tells them, and they know where they are. And every time he changes, somehow they know. How is this happening? And somebody says, it's the prophet Elisha. If you just go kill Elisha, then you can kill the rest. And so the entire army goes to Elisha's house, right? <laughs> Elisha's in Dothan. He sent horses, chariots, and a massive army there, and they went by night and surrounded the city. This is overkill. This is killing a fly with a hammer, right? It seems like. And it says the servant goes out, and he sees this army, horses and chariots surround the city, and he says, what are we going to do? Elisha says, hey, don't be afraid. Those who are with us outnumber those who are with them. His servant's thinking, what are you talking about? Have you seen the army outside? They're just here for us. And Elisha prays, Lord, open his eyes. And the Lord opens the servant's eyes, and it says, the mountains were covered with horses and chariots of fire. It's his servant, didn't I tell you? There's more with them than with us. <laughs> the Lord of hosts, the Lord of hosts. God blinded the army, all done. I have to do one more real quick because this is kind of a good transition. One. Um, this one's with Joshua. Joshua 5. Getting ready to go to Jericho. First battle in, right? Joshua looks up and he sees a man standing in front of him with a sword in his hand. Joshua approaches him. Are you for us or for our enemies? And I love this man's answer. Neither. <laughs> I've come as commander of the Lord's army. God has this vast army that you can't count, and it's like it's divided into sections, and he's got commanders. He says, now I'm a commander. Sword. Oh, are you on their team or ours? I'm on the Lord's team. I'm on the Lord's team. It says, Joshua bowed and said, what do you want me to do? <laughs> Take off your feet, man. This is holy ground. And they get instructions. They go conquer Jericho. So it's not about us against them. It's about the Lord's got an army. Am I fighting the right battles? Am I choosing wisely? It's not about can I get him on my team? It's about, 
am I on his? Am I in a surrendered place where he is fighting my battles? We could go all through the Psalms and just keep finding uh, these references, but um, let me go to the New Testament, because oddly enough, uh, this name appears in our New Testament, and it appears twice, Yahweh Sabaoth, only Greek, um, Lord of hosts, Lord of armies. And it occurs once in Romans, once in James, uh, with two different contexts. The first is the context of covenant and salvation. The second is the context of justice and judgment. Let's look at the first. In Romans chapter 9, really tricky chapters, and there's no need to explain all of them, but it's all about Gentiles and Israel and who has God chosen, who has God elected, and is God just in doing all this. But it's, it all goes back. If you have a Bible and you have it open, um, you've never seen a page with more footnotes at the bottom because he's just quoting a, a Genesis and Malachi and Exodus and um, all the Ezekiel, all these other, Hosea. It's all there. Just trying to remind the Jews and the Gentiles of, of God's promises. And it says in Hosea, I will, not, I will call not my people my people. And she who is unloved, beloved. And so he's saying there's a group of people who've not been my people, but they're going to be my people. There's going to be this group of people that you know as the unloved people, but they're going to be my beloved. And he's just talking about this Jew and Gentile thing. And it will be in the place where they were told, you're not my people. There they will be called sons of the living God. I'm going to choose his people and call them sons of the living God. Isaiah cries out concerned, it's concerning Israel. Though the number of Israelites is like the sand of the sea, only the remnant will be saved. He's talking about this all happens by faith, and there's this, this trusting, believing remnant of people that when everything is wiped out, there's still this people that God has that come by faith. And it says, just as Isaiah predicted, Romans 9.29, if the Lord of hosts had not left us offspring, we would have become like Sodom and made like Gomorrah. If the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the Lord of multitudes, of myriads of myriads of an army, if he had not decided that there would be a remnant, that there would be a, a believing group, and that he would have a new covenant and a new thing going where the Gentiles would come out by faith and, and they would all become this one new people, it would have never happened. So there's this picture that this is all just bigger than you and me when it comes to salvation and being in God's covenant and believing in Christ and coming into that. There's something bigger going on than that. There is all secured and all assured and all takes place because the Lord of hosts has arranged it to be this way. And if you go back um, to Jeremiah 31 where he's talking about the new covenant that's coming, look, the days are coming Jeremiah 31, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, and it will be not like, not like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, even though I'm their master. Instead, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, the Lord's declaration. I will put my teaching within them, and I will write it on their hearts. So this is, teaching will not be external to you. I'm going to put teaching inside of you. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And no longer will you teach your neighbor, know the Lord. They're going to know me from the least to the greatest. And then he says, for I will forgive their iniquity and never again remember their sin. There's a new covenant of forgiveness, of never remembering sin again, of making these people, and this is what the Lord says, the one who gives the sun for light by day and fix the order of moon and stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea and makes its waves roar, the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth is his name. And if this fixed order departs from before me, this is the Lord's declaration, only then will Israel's descendants cease to be a nation before me forever. So Jeremiah did not know the connection between the moon and the tides and all of that. But God says, look, 
You've got the sun in the day. You've got the moon and the stars at night. You've got the waves that just come and go. He says, my promises are sure as long as that's happened. So, <laughs> so Paul is reaching back and pulling out this new covenant, these promises of forgiveness of sin and God creating a people. It's almost like he goes back and says, how do you know this is true? Well, the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts says that if the sun goes down tonight and there's a stars and a moon, even they're still behind the clouds, you're good. And if the sun comes up, it's just another say of God saying, oh, the covenant still stands. I still have forgiveness by faith in Jesus Christ. And day after day after day, the Lord of hosts is ensuring that our sins are forgiven and the new covenant is fulfilled and will be kept. And he put a reminder and built it in to nature so that every time you go to the beach and the next wave follows and another wave follows and another wave follows, you just know that grace and grace and grace and more mercy and more mercy and the promises are sure and the promises are sure and they're yes and they're yes in Christ. The Lord of hosts has ensured it. Romans, the first New Testament reference to the Lord of hosts. The second New Testament reference is over in James. Um, James chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. And this harkens back to the Minor Prophets, which we spent months in. Um, you remember in the Minor Prophets, um, you go to the Minor Prophets and it's just the Lord of Hosts, the Lord of Hosts, the Lord of Hosts, over and over again, the Lord of Armies, over and over and over again. And you remember the Minor Prophets, just over and over again, judgment is coming because you take advantage of the vulnerable. You take advantage of the widow, the orphan, the poor, the refugee, the immigrant, and God is passionate about serving and helping those people, and you take advantage of them instead. And now you're going to be fighting against the Lord of hosts because judgment's coming. Listen to what James says. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail over the miseries coming on you. Your wealth has rotted and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver are corroded and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. Okay, that's pretty strong. You have stored up treasure in these last days. And I'm just gonna, it's not going to help you. Look what he says. Look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who mowed your fields cries out. And the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on earth and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. How about that one? How about the Lord of an uncountable army being on the side of the person who gets cheated his wages by the man with riches? Wow. So the next time someone's debating how much we should pay people in Congress, I'm just waiting for the congressman to stand up and read James chapter 5. <laughs> I don't even know how that works. Who gets a raise? I don't know. I just know that if you're taking advantage of the poor, the Lord of hosts is going to fight against you with them. Oof. That's a punch in the gut. And so you go back to the minor prophets, and what does it say? You've rejected the word of Yahweh Sabaoth. You've rejected the word of the Lord of hosts, and the Lord of hosts is the protector of the vulnerable. So he secures your salvation, but he also fights on behalf of the vulnerable. It's the two New Testament references. Now, I can't stop here because you know what I have to do. I have to take this into the future, and I've got a bunch of passages from Isaiah, but I'll just give you a couple about the Lord of hosts. Because you go through the Psalms and there's this, this beauty and this delight in the dwelling place of the Lord of hosts, the, the city, the temple of the Lord of hosts. But when you get to Isaiah, and you see this projected out into the coming kingdom of Messiah. And you look at this picture of what the nations will do and what we will do and what Messiah will do, what the Lord of hosts will do. Let me just read some of these. Isaiah chapter 2. This is the vision that Isaiah, son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established at the top of the mountains and will be raised above the hills. 
So of all the hills and mountains on earth, there will be one. And it says, and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let's go to the mountain of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the God of Jacob, and, and he will teach us about his ways so that we may walk in his paths. For instruction will go out of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will settle disputes among the nations and provide arbitration for many peoples. And they will beat their swords into plows and their spears into pruning knives. Nation will not take up sword against nation, and they will never fight again or train for war. How do we know this? For a day belonging to the Lord of hosts, a day belonging to the Lord of armies is coming against all the proud and the lofty, against all that's lifted up, and it will be humbled. He goes through this long list of all the different ones will be humbled and brought down. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. So when you have these pictures in the Old Testament, you go, how in the world is the Lord going to defeat all these enemies? He's the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of hosts. (laughs) Here's one, Isaiah 9. For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. You know this one? We just got through Christmas. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast, his prosperity will never end, and he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now and forevermore. How do we know? Because the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. You can imagine a day where God, with an army that can't be counted, brings justice, puts the government under the head of King Jesus. No more war. What am I going to do with this sword? I know, I'll plow with it. How's he going to do that? He's the Lord of hosts. One more. On this mountain, Isaiah 25, on this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all the peoples a feast. Now you picture that. An, An army that can't be counted, and the Lord of that army comes out and says, Let me make you a meal. A feast with aged wine, prime cuts of choice meat, fine vintage wine. It's going to be good, y'all. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the burial shroud, the shroud over all the peoples, the sheet covering all the nations. And when he has swallowed up death, once for all, the Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face and remove his people's disgrace from the whole earth, for the Lord has spoken. And on that day it will be said, Look, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he has saved us. This is the Lord. We've waited for him. Let's rejoice and be glad in his salvation, for the Lord's power will rest on this mountain. The Lord of armies will become a crown of beauty to the remnant of his people spirit of justice to the one who sits in judgment and strength to those who repel attacks at the city gates. The Lord of us, be encouraged, be encouraged. Not only your own personal salvation, not only the church of us coming together under the gospel, not only is that ensured by the Lord of hosts, the Lord of angel armies, our future is, our future in his kingdom, our future of his coming day of justice and feasting with him all the nations coming to rejoice in the beauty and the splendor. It's all secured by Yahweh Sabaoth. Be encouraged. He has secured it and he will complete it. Be encouraged by what he's done. Be encouraged by what he is doing. He is on the side of the vulnerable. So when we work with ministries like PACN and others, and when we help the poor who get wiped out by hurricanes and helped, right, when we're feeding orphans, we're doing the work of the Lord of Armies. So he's fighting with us. He's fighting for us. And be encouraged by what he has yet to do. Listen. 
These are the battles that matter. Church, don't run to Egypt. Don't run to Egypt for help. Don't cry conspiracy every time there's a conspiracy. It's the word of Isaiah. The Lord of hosts. Fight the battles where you know you're on his side. Fight the battles for justice and good news. Trust in Yahweh, Sabaoth, for what he's done, for what he's doing, and for what he has yet to do. You pray with me. Lord, we are so encouraged. Our lives are in very good hands. And so for my brothers and sisters who are feeling defeated and discouraged, Lord, you're never defeated. And Lord, would you lift the shame and replace it with beauty? Would you lift the guilt and replace it with freedom and forgiveness? You're the Lord of hosts. You could do this. You're zealous for this. And Lord, for the ones who are wondering if they're have been abandoned, and if you're still around, you're the Lord of hosts. You've made a covenant in the blood of Jesus. Of course you are. Help my brothers and sisters now to just feel encouraged and secure in the hands of Yahweh Sabaoth, Lord of armies. And Lord, when the day comes and you stand on this earth and the kingdom comes, May it be that we stand in majesty because we chose the right battles to fight and we fought for the right people. Lord, it's so heartbreaking to watch your people fighting battles. They've got no business fighting All the while, it's the vulnerable who gets swallowed up every time. Lord, I pray that we would never, ever try to talk you into being on our side. Lord, I pray that we would fight the battles the Lord of hosts is fighting, and may we fight them with confidence and courage compassion. Thank you for fighting for us, Lord. Thank you for fighting for us. What an army. And Lord, I pray that when the sun comes up tomorrow, we'd be reminded your covenant still stands. I pray that when we see the stars in the moon at night, we'd be reminded the covenant still stands. And the Lord of all those angels, the Lord of all those stars, is our Father who gave his Son, who secured the covenant in that blood. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I love you, church. See you soon.